It, it's pretty cool. We're talking about, you know, blessings to our children and the generations to come. And, and I mean, our, our children's ministry are out of sight, right, a lot of times. But they are doing some unbelievable things. And um, it's making a difference. You know, the, the Old Testament talks about a child shall lead them something about childlike faith and just a heart for God that ministers to us. I knew it was coming. You guys, I saw it first service. I knew it was coming. I still cried. (laughs) If you have a Bible, open to Matthew chapter 21 with me. This is the triumphal entry. It's the same passage that Pastor Danny used on this last Wednesday, and he did an awesome sermon. I love that. My gosh. I'm going to preach the same thing, different, but a different way. And uh, I just love that, what, it, what he did. In Matthew 21, it's uh, every gospel, the four gospels, they all talk about this triumphal entry. I like Matthew's. I'm going to get in Luke just, to, just for a second. And... Um, there's something powerful about this, this special day, this parade day, this welcoming of the king. It was a parade uh, unlike anything that Israel had seen at the time. Some of you guys have been to parades, right? You been? Anyone been to the Rose Parade? They say between 1 and 1.5 million people attend the Rose Parade. <laughs> but according to the... Jewish, uh, I mean, the Roman historian Josephus, uh, this Jewish festival regularly hit over 2 million people in and around Jerusalem. On the hills, they would be uh, camped out for the whole week, the festival of Passover. And so there would have been hundreds of thousands of people. Now, conservatively, it's estimated there were 100,000 people at this triumphal entry of Jesus. You can imagine. Now get that picture in your mind. Crowds, sweltering crowds. And all the, all the people. And what that was like. And here we are in Matthew chapter 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, ride gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's interesting, you know, they, they put their coats, their jackets on the ground. I don't know if you've ever done that for somebody, but I haven't. But it was a common thing for a, the procession of a new king. And it wasn't planned. People hadn't planned this. It said they went out and cut branches. They didn't come ready for this. It was just something that was a spur of the moment, a recognition that Jesus was the coming king. He was coming into the city. And let's make a way for him. He is the king. There's something about the Holy Spirit stirring up people at that point. And they said, let's, let's, let's welcome him as the king. Not a non-planned event where 100,000 people show up. How's that? Hosanna in the highest heaven. The word Hosanna means save us. We sang that song this morning, Hosanna. Save us, Lord. Verse 10, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts, straight to the temple. Jesus went straight to the temple. 
He didn't go anywhere else from outside the, the city, over the hill, straight to the temple. Where else would Jesus go but his father's house? And drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests of the teachers and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, Jesus replied. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out to the city of Bethany where he spent the night. There's two scenes in this passage. Two different scenes. The one is the parade. He's riding on a donkey. The second scene is in the temple. And they're unique in a couple of ways. Number one, it's the first time that we see that Jesus is worshipped openly. Five days before he goes to the cross, he's worshipped. And secondly, the song that they sang on the, on the parade route into the, the triumphal entry and the song that the children sang in the temple were the same song. Hosanna. Hosanna to the son of David. It's interesting, the children were singing the same song that the parents were singing just moments earlier. I just want to say this. You are influential. Kids are listening. Kids are watching. You parents and grandparents. You big brothers and uncles and aunts and sisters. They're watching you. Moms and dads. Kids, you think they're not, but they are. They hear everything. The good, bad, and the ugly. They hear everything. And here they had heard their, they had heard their parents and their family members and their friends, this older one, singing the song. And they resonated that song and they kept that song in their heart. Let me say this, church. You're a role model. Now, you can't take the Charles Barkley approach. Basketball player years ago famously said, I'm not a role model. Because he was a role model. Because people were watching, people were looking at him, and people are looking at us. And we are role models, for good or for bad. We're going to set an example one way or the other. I'm thankful that the parents heeded the voice of the Spirit, worshipped God on that day, and the children did the same. They were singing the same song, and that song was out of Psalm 118. It was one of the psalms that Israel had sung. It was on their song list, if you will. It might have been one of the songs that they were singing on the way, on, the, on their trip to Jerusalem. It was a messianic song. And I want, to, I want to read that to you in Psalm 118. I want you to hear the words of the psalm that they were singing that day. It starts off in verse 1 with the national anthem of the Israelites. It says this, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, His love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, His love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, His love endures forever. And let the people of Hope Chapel say, Verse 5, when hard pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. Does it sound like what Pastor Kay shared a few moments ago? Is that shared? I'm, I'm in triumph. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Verse 10, all the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. This is, this is one of those David psalms where it's like, I kick my enemies in the teeth, Lord. <laughs> it's not, 
This is not, this, this, is, this is a victory one. And it's against not his physical enemies, it's against the, the enemy who's working against him, uh, the enemy of his soul. Those enemies, it's not people, we don't battle against flesh and blood, but I'm, I'm, I'm in battle against the demonic forces, spiritual wickedness in high places, principalities and powers. I'm in, I'm in battle against them. In the name of the Lord, I cut them down. They surrounded me on every side, verse 11. But in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. They swarmed around me like bees. They were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them down. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my defense and has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. Come on. Come on. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. And I'll listen to this. From this point on, it's very, very prophetic and it's messianic. This is about Jesus and what he's done doing in this last week. Listen to what it says. Verse 17, I will not die but live. And it was the enemy who wanted to kill him. I'm not going to die. I'm going to live. This is what Jesus was saying. And will proclaim what the Lord has done. That's the gospel. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Isaiah says this. It was the Father's good will to bruise me or punish me or punish him. The suffering servant, the Messiah. Because it was through his stripes that we would be healed. Verse 19 Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. Isn't that true about Jesus? He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the gate to salvation. This is all about him. Psalm 118 is about Jesus. Listen, they were singing Jesus' song on that day. Verse 21, I will give you thanks for you answered me. You become my salvation. Isn't it true that Jesus is salvation? The stone the builders rejected had become the cornerstone. The builders, who were the builders? The teachers of the law, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were supposed to be building the kingdom of God, but they didn't. In fact, they rejected this cornerstone. They rejected Jesus. Verse 23, the Lord has done this. It's marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice and be glad. Lord, save us. Hosanna. There it is. Save us. Hosanna. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Have you heard that recently? From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. Get your your palm branches, throw them down. We're on our way to the temple. This is the psalm. This is the prophetic psalm of Jesus' triumphal entry. You are my God, verse 28. I will praise you. You are my God. I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord. Here's that national anthem again. It opens and closes with this. For he is good, his love endures forever. Now that passage of the triumphal entry is in every every gospel. And it's details, some details are highlighted and some are not mentioned in some of the other ones. But one of them is in Luke. And I love this passage in Luke. When they had started crying out, to, you know, Hosanna, when he was riding on the donkey. And this is what the Pharisees said. In Luke 19, it says this. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. <laughs> because they were all singing. All, all these followers, not just the 12 disciples, the thousands, the throngs of people. In fact, it was, getting, it was so many people at that thing that they were saying among themselves, What are we going to do with Jesus? The whole world is following him. It was that kind of a day. The tide was turning, and people were saying yes to Jesus. Jesus said this, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. (laughs) This is like I've heard to say, you don't want to be replaced by a rock, you know, so make make sure you're a worshiper, right? But there's something about this day that's special. This day was a prophetic day. It was inevitable. It was going to happen. Jesus was going to come on the, through the hills, over the hills of Jerusalem, and straight into the temple, riding on a donkey. 
It was going to happen. And there was going to be worship. Worship of the king. Worship of the Messiah. First time. But it was going to happen. Whether people were involved or not. There was, I don't know if the stones would cry out or angels would have showed up and just said, Holla, did the hallelujah chorus right there. But, if people did, but people were worshiping. It was going to happen. It was prophesied that he would come riding on a donkey in Zechariah 9. It was prophesied that people would lay down their garments and branches on the ground in 2 Kings chapter 9. It was prophesied that Jesus would go straight into the temple in Malachi chapter 3. It was prophesied that children would sing in Psalm chapter 8. It was prophesied that Jesus would be the gate, that he would not die but live, and that the timing that was all set by the Father in Psalm 118. It was prophesied this was going to happen the only question is, were they going to be a part of it or not? Were they going to participate in it or not? Were they going to worship? There's going to be another inevitable time. And Jesus is going to come back again. He's going to come back again. And this time, not on a humble donkey. He's going to come back in glory. He's going to come back to set up his kingdom. And it's going to be a different ballgame. The question is, will we worship? Will we be singing? Will we be laying down our lives, not just our palm branches, but will we have been laying down our lives? Because that's who's he, who he's coming for. He's coming for the people who love him. Matthew 21 was his earthly coronation, but there will be a heavenly coronation. And in that day, Revelation talks about the heavenly coronation. And it says this, that there's going to be a, an angelic host that's going to be worshiping. 10,000 times 10,000 angels are going to be leading the hallelujah, the heavenly choir. And then it says, every living creature will join this choir. So all that are left, all that those have been saved, all the redeemed ones, and they'll join that choir, and they're going to be singing that song. He is worthy to receive honor and praise and glory and power. He is worthy. The Lamb who is slain is worthy. That's our song, guys. And that's what, that's what he's going to be, we're going to be singing. On this day in Matthew 21, there were two groups of people. There were the singers and the non-singers. There were the people who recognized Jesus people who didn't recognize Jesus. I want to share with you four things about those people that recognized Jesus. There's some, four things that stood out to me. Number one, those people who were singing, they were seeking salvation. They said, they said, Hosanna, Hosanna, Lord, save us. They knew that they needed saving. They recognized their need for a savior. The religious people, they thought, ah, we don't need, we're, we're doing great. We don't need this Jesus guy T tells us he can forgive sins. Who, is, who do you think he is? Do we see our need for salvation? Are we aware of our need for salvation? When was the last time that we asked God to forgive us? Well, I did that, you know, years ago. I went to the altar. I cried like a baby. You should have seen me. I was a mess. Yeah, but did we do it recently? Because you know what? Grace isn't something that you get once. Grace is something that you get all the time. And how do you plug into grace? But you ask for it. Lord, I, I, need, Lord, I messed up. Help. Boom, he's there. He's so gracious, loving, patient. He's good. Faithful. And he shows up and we ask and say, Lord, I messed up again. He says, I got you. The blood of Christ continually cleanses you from all unrighteousness. That's what the scripture says. But it happens through repentance and confession. That's how that works. It doesn't happen automatically. God doesn't forgive sin that we won't repent of. Do I get an amen? Amen. Yeah, or do we know that we need salvation? Not only that, of our own need. But what about the needs of others? Do we see people as needing salvation? Do we, when we go into a grocery store, 
Do we see people as who they are? Do we see them as just, you know, walking around? Or do we see, hey, those, those people there, they, they might need Jesus. I, I go to a, every time I go to a large sporting event, I mean, it's baseball season now, it just started. I love to go to a couple baseball games a year. But I can't help but sitting around 50,000 of my closest friends and think, okay, how many of these folks don't know the Lord? A lot. Where's our heart? Do we recognize the brokenness in people Jesus did? The religious people didn't even see it. They didn't see it in themselves. They didn't see it in other people. They thought they were fine, and they, they were wondering, Jesus, why do you spend so much time with the drunks, with the, the, the gluttons, the, the people who are just messed up? Why do you spend so much time? And he said, it's not, the, it's not the healthy people that need a physician. It's the sick that need a physician. I'm going to where the hurt is. And these people didn't even recognize their own hurt. They didn't realize they were in need. That leads me to number two. These people were humble. They were humble. They didn't trust in themselves, their own righteousness. They were humble. They recognized a need for the Lord. It wasn't just Jesus who came on a humble animal, the donkey. He's the king of the humble. He's the humble king who's king of the humble, and he won't have it any other way. There's nothing like pride that will keep us from the Lord. And I'll tell you, church, it happens sometimes with believers because we, we get blessed and we have success, and then we forget God. We're like, God, where are you? Because you forget God and things start going bad. Do we know that we need him and that we're humble? How do I know if I'm not humble? Well, here's, here's how you know. It's a little test, litmus test. If you find yourself during the week thinking, sure, I'm glad I'm not like them. Didn't Jesus tell a story about that? The two people praying, the one, the one sinner, he said, beat his chest and said, Father, forgive me. I, forgive me my sin and cried and wept. And then another guy, the religious guy on the, to his side and looked over and said, oh, I'm glad I'm not like that. Which one got forgiveness that day? So if we compare ourselves against anyone, well, I'm more cleaned up than they are. Really? Well, so really, it's about how good we have it now? Is it about our works or how good we're doing in life? No. I mean, I'm glad that our lives get cleaned up, but it doesn't mean us that we're any less needy of grace. We need grace. Jesus said this, blessed are the poor in spirit. The New Living Translation says, and those who realize their need for him. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. The humble. It's those who recognize. The third thing about these people is that they were asking God to make changes. They were asking God to intervene. They were asking God to show up and make and change the way things were. They weren't content with the status quo, they weren't happy, you know, kind of fat and happy. They weren't just, weren't just like, hey, we're, we're, don't, don't make any changes. Everything's perfect. No, these people were hungry. Jesus talked about it. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. They wanted change. In our in a prayer room this morning, Wanda and myself and Pastor John were just praying before the service. We were praying for the church this morning. And I really liked um, Pastor Johnny, he prayed this way. He didn't know what my message was, but he prayed. And I wrote it down after, right out as soon as he prayed it because I thought, that's, that's point three of my message, man. He prayed, Lord, we long for you and we long to be changed by you. See, it's, a, it's the willingness, the want to, Lord, change, not just my circumstance, but change me. Make a change in me. God, do something new in me. When was the last time God did something new in you. He wants to continue to do something new in us. He's working on us continually until the day that we go to see him. He's not done working on us yet. Change my heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. You see, a stony heart can't grow anything. Jesus told that parable of the four soils, the, the soil that was rocky soil, that was a, a path, a, so, a soil that was full of weeds, 
And then good soil. You know what the good soil is? It's the soil that's been torn up. That's longing for change. God, rip open the, the, the hard places in my life and plant, plant something of your kingdom in me. James says it this way. Humbly receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Humbly receive the word implanted. How do you get a word implanted in you? you got to have a prepared heart. And some of us just I say, Lord, just renew my heart. Give me a soft heart to hear your word, to hear from your spirit, and not to put you off when you call. Number four, these people who were singing that day, they recognized that Jesus was king, that he was the Lord. They called him the son of David. That was a Hosanna, son of David. That was a term that only one person could, could own. And it was the Messiah. It was a son of David, the one who was going to be their deliverer, that long-awaited savior of the nation. He was the only one, and it was the only time that anyone had ever sang it, and they sang it on that day, Hosanna, save us, son of David. They were saying, you're the Lord. You're the Lord. Now, there's something about being Lord, and you call, and you call him Lord, that includes a response. Because I can't call him Lord and not do what he says. I can't say you're the king of my life and then live the way I want to live. If you're in charge, then you tell me what to do, and that's what I'm going to do. Jesus said it this way. He said, if a, like a wise man and a foolish man, a foolish man does what he wants to do and lives his life the way he plans his own life. He's like a man that builds his house on sand. But a wise man is someone who builds his house on the words that I'm speaking and does what, what I say. He's like a man who builds his house on a rock. And there's a difference. There's a big difference. We, we're lucky, Kay and I are lucky enough to live in a house that's built on a rock. We try to dig in. I, I try to dig around it to put some things next to the house. I couldn't even get it. Took a jackhammer. Want to put that water line in, David? You had to go through shale. I mean, it was it was granite. It was rock. And I'm I'm so thankful that the house was built on a rock. Because it's been through all kinds of earthquakes. It's been all through all kinds of storms. And I mean, it's it's lasted the test of time from 1962 till now and hasn't moved. It's a foundation that's solid. And I'm going to tell you guys, there's earthquakes coming. What's happening right now in the world, those are tremors. Those are just signs of what's going to come. This is not the great tribulation. It's a warm-up. It's a warm-up. And things are really going to shake. And the Bible says everything that can be shaken will be shaken. The Bible says if you make Jesus the king and do what he says, then you're like the man who builds his house on a rock. It doesn't matter if everything's shaken. You're going to be all right. You're going to make it. It doesn't matter what happens in the world. It doesn't matter if you're pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib. It doesn't matter. You're going to be safe with Jesus if you, if you will do what he says. That's making him king. Or you can trust like the Pharisees did. You can trust in your own goodness and hope for the best. Trust in your righteousness. I'm a good person. I don't, I'm, I'm not doing terrible crimes. I'm not stealing. I'm not cheating. I mean, I am a pastor. That's not bad. The thing is, it's just not good enough. See, our righteousness, the Bible says, is like filthy rags. It doesn't matter how good we are. It will not measure up to God's perfect standard. The only way that we can measure up is through the shed blood of Jesus applied to our lives. That's it. The only way we can get it is because he's righteous. It's called imputed righteousness. He puts his righteousness on us when we believe in him. He looks at us and he says, clean, clean, forgiven. That's what he says. Before we leave today, I want to pray. For us as a congregation, would you bow your heads with me? Lord, we want to be like those people on that road. We want to be people who 
really are hungry for you, that seek you out. And Lord, I pray that we'd be people who'd be quick to ask for forgiveness, recognizing our own need for a Savior. We would be people who say, Lord, forgive me quickly. I messed up. God, we want to be people who are humble. I pray that you guard our heart against pride. Any pride at all that just is a stench to you. It just stinks to high heaven. Any, any pride at all. We want to be people of humility. We want to be people of Jesus. Lord, we want to be people who are longing for change. Longing and hungering and thirsting for your righteousness, for your kingdom to be established in us, around us. God, we want to see change. We want to be people who contend for that, who cry out, who pray for change. And most importantly, we want to be people who call you king. People who call you Lord. Because you are the Lord. You are the king. We don't want to miss that day. We don't want to miss the second coronation when all creation will rise up and sing and worship you. We want to be in that holy crowd, that holy choir. I want to give an op opportunity just right now. I, church, I don't know everybody here, and I don't know where you are with God. But I do know that if you don't know the Lord and if you reject the goodness of God, you're not going to be in heaven. Not everyone gets to heaven. Jesus said the, the road is broad that leads to destruction. And he said the road is narrow that leads to life and few are those who find it. Be one of the few. Be one of the ones that's the salmon that swims upstream, that goes against the flow of this world and be the one of those that cries out and says yes to Jesus. Don't let one day go by. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. In other words, today is the day of God's grace and his opportunity for forgiveness and new life. God wants to do something new in us. He wants to forgive us, and then he wants to adopt us into his family. He wants to take us into the household, include us in everything that he does. He wants to love on us and pour out his love on our life. And it starts with making him king. It starts with accepting him. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would just believe, would trust in him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. Simple stuff. Simple. Powerful. The book of Romans says, all who call on the name of the Lord, the king, Jesus. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you're here today and you want with me, you want to say, hey, pastor, I want to call on God's name. I want to make sure I'm in God's family. Maybe you never were, maybe you never have been in God's family. Maybe you walked away from him and just started doing your own thing. You decided to take life into your own hands and, and it hasn't worked out real good, right? Regardless, let's come to the king today. Today's the day. Don't wait for tomorrow. You don't know what tomorrow holds. Yesterday, a professional football player was hit by a dump truck. He was killed. Hit by a truck, a dump truck. He didn't see that coming. We don't know what tomorrow holds. I'm not trying to scare you in the kingdom. Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am. Because you don't want to go into eternity without the king. That's a scary thing. Do not go without the king. If you need the king in your life, you want to say yes to Jesus today, just raise your hand. That's me. Yeah, I need him. I need him. I need him. I ask you to raise your hand because, like, it's, who cares whatever other, uh, someone else thinks? Who cares? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. Hello. Yeah, Hello. Raising both hands. I'm, who cares what people think? You be a Jesus person. 
Don't, no matter what the world, no matter what your family, no matter what, whether your friend, your spouse, doesn't matter what anyone else does, you be a God follower. You be a God seeker. Be hardcore. Go for it. Dive in. Get a Bible and read it every day. Pray. Be a worshiper. Find out where Air One is on your radio station. Just play it, man. Play it. Get built up in your faith. This world is, I mean, it's going to hell in a handbasket. You, I'm serious. It's going down. The Bible says it's going to go from bad to worse at the, in the end days. That's what's happening right now. I think God's going to have a revival come in the midst of that. In the midst of things getting worse, you're going to see people say yes to Jesus. Like we've, There's more people have been, that are alive right now than have ever lived in the history of mankind. More people alive right now. This is the time for a revival. And it starts right now. Let's say a prayer together. Those of you who raised your hands, I want you to say it out loud. The rest of the congregation, let's say it with me, would you? Lord Jesus, Jesus. save me. Save. Forgive me of my sin. Save. Wash me. Wash. Make me new. Make me new. Direct, my life. Direct my life. I invite you, Holy Spirit. Have your way with me. Amen.